Good afternoon and welcome to another daily update from the Wildlife Trust. It's getting to crunch time now in the negotiations. It's really hotting up here in the last few days. But the theme today for the UK COP presidency is all about cities, regions and the built environment. So we're going to take this opportunity to talk about planning and how the planning system can help put nature into recovery and can help people's access towards nature. Because we all know that a healthy natural environment is key to our prosperity, but it's also key to our health. But unfortunately, access to nature in the UK is deeply unequal. The most deprived areas of the country are 10 times less likely to have access to nature. And a study in 2009 from Natural England showed that the NHS could save £2.1 billion in averted health costs if everyone had equal access to nature. So levelling up access to nature and get it, getting it on people's doorsteps is a really important issue. Craig's going to be having a look, look and a bit of a deep dive into that later and we're going to have an interview with NHS doctor and Wildlife Trust ambassador Dr Amir Khan. But first of all, Craig's going to be having a look at what's happened over the last 24 hours here at COP. OK, thanks, Elliot. Yes, we really are getting into the end game now here in Glasgow at COP26. The way I would describe it is how COPs have evolved over the years. They kind of work at three levels. You have the fundamentally the formal text, which is negotiated as a consensus agreement. It has to be a consensus agreement between 195 countries. Because it's a consensus agreement, that means then it is the lowest common denominator. It is raising the low bar of what countries are saying about the action they want to take on climate change. That's the formal text that is being negotiated. Then you have the next level, which is the bilateral or trilateral or multilateral agreements between many uh, members, many parties to the convention, but not necessarily all of them. And so all the announcements we saw last week, the one on methane, the ones on coal, the ones on deforestation, and those are significant and those are useful, but it's not quite the same as all 195 countries uh, coming together. And then above that, you kind of have these much more kind of informal uh, narratives and framings and discussions that are ongoing. And so, for example, at this COP, we've seen much more on nature in that kind of area and the branding of this and the framing and narratives around this COP being much more about nature than in any COP I've ever seen before. And typically what happens over the years is what starts as a sort of informal framing and discussions at the top level finally translates down into sort of multilateral agreements at the next level and that finally permeates through into the formal text that 195 countries might agree. That's the sort of progression we've seen over the, over the years. And I would suspect that by the end of this COP, the big debate will be that the developing countries will be trying to say, come on, if you're going to come back every year, you're going to try and get us to come back every year to offer more in terms of cuts. You also need to be coming back, the rich countries, every year in terms of offering more on finance. And I think that will be a big sort of negotiation in these last day or two of COP. But of course, overnight there's also been that big development about the agreement between the US and China, which counts in that second level of an agreement between just two countries. But because it's US and China, the two the world's two biggest polluters, it's very significant. The only other thing to say is, of course, Boris Johnson came uh, back to the COP26 uh, yesterday, and amongst other things, uh, he was asked whether uh, he would look at the UK signing up to the deal that Costa Rica and Denmark have done, in which they say that they're going to set a date to end fossil fuel exploration and production. Uh, it's a real disappointment that so far the UK hasn't done that, because I think that would be really, really useful, particularly when you've got all the oil and gas exploration in the North Sea and elsewhere. Uh, but Boris Johnson and did say he would look at the details of that uh, negotiation between Costa Rica and Denmark. And we would absolutely say, obviously, the sooner we can end oil and gas exploration uh, and production with a just transition for people in those uh, industries, uh, the sooner the UK can move further forward on tackling dangerous climate change. Today's theme at COP is cities, regions and the built environment. And this is an incredibly important theme because actually what we've seen over recent years, time and again, is it's actually cities and regions often taking the lead 
on tackling the climate emergency uh, way ahead of the ambition that perhaps is often set by national governments. So many of our wildlife trusts focused doing brilliant work in and around our largest cities because the potential is so great there. When you can get local people involved in putting nature in recovery, then it's amazing what can be done. And of course, getting nature in recovery, looking after nature close to where people live, is really important, yes, for nature, yes, for helping us tackle the climate emergency, but also really good also for people's physical and mental well-being. There's so many benefits if uh, we can absolutely make sure that nature is in recovery in and around our towns and cities. But at the Wildlife Trust, we also think a lot more could be done to improve that. That's why we're calling for our planning system to be improved so that it can actually support nature's recovery. In particular, we want to see a new planning designation that we would call Wild Belt that would allow uh, planners and local authorities to zone areas that currently might be of low value to nature, but zone them in such a way that means they're set aside to put nature in recovery so that we can create new spaces for local communities to uh, have time in nature. And those spaces could also provide nature-based solutions, both to help mitigate climate change by drawing carbon out of the air as they they become wilder but actually perhaps even more importantly in that to help adapt to uh, climate change so that they can be places where water can go in extreme weather events rather than into people's homes so that they can uh, cool the urban heat island through trees and bushes and hedgerows and other other things and absolutely make sure that our cities as they become wilder actually are nicer places to live particularly when we're facing increased temperatures. Wild Belt. Did you know that the UK is one of the most nature depleted countries in the world? We need to support nature's recovery and bring back our wild spaces, but currently there's no protection for recovering land. Because of this, animals are often left without viable habitats. This is why the wildlife trusts want to introduce the Wild Belt designation. With this new label, we can bring nature into these places and protect them for the future. By classifying these areas as Wild Belt, we could ensure they're protected from development and allowed to flourish. Communities would be at the heart of these spaces, breathing life back into the land. Wild Belt is a pivotal way to combat the climate and nature crisis our world faces. We need your help to connect and protect 30% of land and seas for nature by 2030. With Wild Belt, we can bring nature back. It's clear that a wilder planning system can really help put nature into recovery and give people better access to nature. So to look at this more, we're going to have an interview with Dr Amir Khan, NHS doctor and Wildlife Trust ambassador. He spoke to Tasha Savage, a youth council member from Lancashire Wildlife Trust. The message that people need to, to know is that, um, you know, by helping the environment, by improving biodiversity, we are helping ourselves. By improving air quality, burning less fossil fuels, you reduce your risk right now of cardiovascular disease, of certain cancers, uh, uh, of, of lung conditions. It improves your immune system. All of these are very very factual things and immediate benefits that we can feel, as well as those long-term benefits to future future generations. I was very lucky yeah. where I grew up, um, sort of in the heart of the Shropshire Hills, and I, I was one of those people that had nature a five-minute walk away. As a kid living in a single-parent family who was constantly on the breadline, I don't know what I would have done if I didn't have the green space, because as much as I didn't have other things, you know, I always had the Shropshire Hills, I always had the woods, I always had somewhere to go. And moving to, to Greater Manchester was a bit of a shock because I was just like, oh, where do I where do I go? Everything's a building. Where's where's my forest? Where's my hills? Where's my yeah. nature? Um, and that difference that, that you, you you describe between your, your where you grew up to where you live now, yeah. I think is really, really important because it talks about access to these areas. You know, we know about the health benefits to to being in green spaces. And it starts, you know, right from from childhood from pregnancy you know even pregnant women who have 
access to green areas, trees, that kind of thing, have babies with better birth weights, higher birth weights than those who don't, than people from inner city areas that, that live, you know, uh, in, from poorer backgrounds have less access to these, to these green spaces. And, and it's really important that we try and redress that, that imbalance. Yes, we might need more houses because Britain needs more houses, but how do we make housing estates more nature friendly. Like I know the Wildlife Trust is trying to push through planning reforms to make it into law that you know these sort of new build estates and, and if you're building uh, areas and new houses you know you have to have nature five minute walk away you have to bring nature into into the new build. Uh, and I think you know by saying we have to make it into law I think that's you know yeah. it can no longer be a recommendation we've gone past that stage of, of, you know, saying, well, we recommend this and it's soft kind of wording around it. It, it. it has to be law. And this idea of from the Wildlife Trust about having 30% of our lands and seas protected yeah. uh, uh, for, for, for wild spaces and wildlife, uh, I think is key. It has to be law for it to work. That was really great to hear from Amir and Tasha about the impact access to nature can have. But now we want your help. We want to show the government that the public wants a wild belt. Follow the link below and you can put places near you, great places for nature, onto the map to show the government that we need to get wild belt introduced. That's it from us now. Tune in tomorrow at 12 o'clock again for the very last day of COP to find out what's been going on at this crunch time.